Let's pray. Gracious Father, ah, truly we do come here today uh, in amazement of who you are, and Lord, submitting ourselves unto you. Father, we pray that you would uh, speak into our lives and into our hearts this morning, uh, Lord, your truth, uh, that we would submit ourselves unto you, uh, following after all that you've called us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to continue today in our series through 1 Samuel, and some of you are probably tired of 1 Samuel. So we're going to take a bigger chunk of space, of real estate today. We're going to go through chapters uh, 24 and 25. Um, in, in life, we're, we're often faced with, with decisions, and, and these decisions can be, present dilemmas. I remember when uh, I was called to the military, uh, it was an interesting circumstance in, in life. I was running a business, and the business was doing quite well. And to go in would mean I'd have to sell the business. There was no way for me to do it and, and go because I was going to be gone for months at a time on the front end part of it. And it didn't make sense to me because we were in a position, uh, it was a mental health counseling office, and, and we had put it in such a position, myself and my business partner, to where we were about to take over a huge contract if we just waited a few more months. The circumstances really dictated from a worldly sense, you continue doing what you're doing because it's going well. But God was abundantly clear and submit to me and go in the military, which was crazy. And we did. And, and subsequently, that was in April of, let's see, April of 2006. In July of 2007, we began planning because I was in the military with my wing chaplain as to plant a church. Had I not done that, God wouldn't have set the stage for the crossroads to happen. A decision that made no sense at all, and it really caused me to kind of look at this and think, well, God, this doesn't make sense. I'm looking at the circumstances, and the circumstances seem to dictate something else. Well, David's going to find, we're going to find David in a couple different locations this morning having some dilemmas. And he's going to be faced with, do I solve this problem on my own, or do I trust God? And in both times, David's going to make the right choice, but he's going to waffle a little bit, and we're going to get to experience a little bit of that with David, but I will give you the, the end result as he's going to actually make the right decision on both these circumstances. But we're going to start off, and because we're covering a lot of real estate, we're not going to read every verse. Uh, we'll jump around through verse, chapters 24 and 25 in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 24, and we're going to read the first few verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's going on, and we'll jump ahead a little bit after that. So beginning in 1 Samuel chapter Chapter 24, verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 of his chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, uh, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. I'll just leave it at that. Now, David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left a cave and went on his way. This is an interesting circumstance. And I think Joe Luce talked about it a little bit. I'm not sure exactly what he got my bit. I heard he talked a little bit. But we're going to go into this a little bit here. Uh, but, but it's fascinating to me because there's this concept in the military, i got to turn this on, uh, that we refer to as situational awareness. And you guys know me, those of you who've been at Crossroads know, I have really horrible situational awareness. So you can guess when I go to school or when I go into training, one thing that gets yelled at me a lot is, Jarman, where's your situational awareness? For instance, we did a uh, mass casualty training, and I was sitting there, and I didn't realize in the midst of this that there was somebody going around killing all the patients while I'm talking to one patient. And uh, this was all fictitious, but they, they called us out and said, so did you see the guy walking around killing everybody? No, I didn't see that. There's your situational awareness. And so the situational awareness is really just being aware of what's going on around you. Now here's a circumstance where we would look and say, Saul doesn't have the best situational awareness. He's going into the cave and he's going to drop trowel and take care of business 
And David and his men are in there. Now, they have pretty good situational where They're reading the situation and they're looking at the circumstances. Oh, my gosh, look at this. Here comes Saul. And oh, my good grief, look what he's doing. This is perfect. Go in and kill him while he's taking a dump. That's even better. But they go in and then David comes up and he's going to cut off a corner. He's, he cuts off a corner. It's fascinating what happens to David at that point. Because his heart strikes him. And he starts to feel guilty. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I, I think if we look at this situation, they're basing the, the initial decision to go up and, and really go after Saul in this moment on a couple of factors. They're looking at this, and, and really I, what I would call four points that would, we would give for approval to kill the king in this moment that I think many of us would fall into. So the first point is David has been anointed. We know that from earlier in the book. We went through and Samuel came out and anoints David to be king. Because God has, Saul has rejected God, and God has said, oh, you're not, not going to be king anymore. And so then Samuel goes out to Jesse, lines up all the boys, and none of them fit. And he's, you got any other kids? He's got, I got that kid out in the middle of the field taking care of the sheep. Call him in, and, and Saul anoint, or, uh, Samuel anoints him. So David's already been anointed king. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. Let's say you're David. And so you know I'm anointed king by God's prophet. You know that. That's a fact. Second thing is the king has been delivered now into your hands. In a very odd way, the king is in there, in the cave, doing his business, and you just happen to be there. And we look at that, that's an interesting circumstance. And then the third thing is Saul is completely vulnerable. <laughs> I was at school, and a chaplain comes down from... We, we, I better preface the story. <laughs> We had our bathrooms or our latrines right outside the classroom. So our instructor said, and the Navy was down at the other end of the building, if you need to, go number two. Do not use our bathrooms. Go down and visit the Navy. So we would go down and do our business. And so it became a joke. Ah, what are you doing? I got to go visit the Navy. And so, so one of the chaplains goes down to visit the Navy, opens the door, and lo and behold, there's somebody in there. Ah! screams and closes the door and comes back and says, make sure you knock before you visit the Navy. This is a very vulnerable spot that Saul finds himself in as he's visiting the Navy. And so we have this going on. So, so you've got these three. You're anointed as king. The king has been delivered. He's there in your hands, even though it's a gross way. And then, but he's completely vulnerable. He's not going to be able to defend himself. And then finally we would get to this. This looks right to kill him. Now I'm going to show of hands... I want you to raise your hand if you'd take the shot, because I know I would. Ah, there's the men. Ah, we're going to take the shot. Kill him. That's right. That's right. And then the women. No, that's terrible. Why would you say such a... Kill the guy. He's right there. Most of us would be sitting there. This is perfect. God's delivered him, and we'd allow the situation to dictate our actions. How often that happens in circumstances of life. That we allow a situation to dictate our actions. Now, going and killing him, we see what happens for David is this is going to be contrary to what God has called. Don't take your don't lift your hand to God's anointed. And so David finds himself in this predicament where really what I think we can see is that David is now going to wrestle with this. He's going to have this internal struggle that what's going to happen is, let me see, where we have this internal struggle where he's going to have to, what it really displays is he's recognizing I'm mistrusting God in this situation. God has called me. It's God's, God's going to be the one that's going to put me on the throne. It's God's throne to give. God will take care of Saul. This is fascinating because this almost doesn't make sense. Why does he not take the shot? Well, there are three points of reason, I think, behind what David's actions really reflect where he doesn't, and, and when we read that his heart struck him because he'd cut off the corner of his robe, there are three reasons I think what we've got here. He's acting against God's anointed. We've established that. Second, he knows that God's going to deal with the throne. God's anointed him. God's going to do it. God's going to deal with me to get on, me on the throne. And the third thing is his actions really start to reflect a mistrust in God. They start to, I, I'll take this situation and I'll solve this problem on my own based upon the situational circumstances that are there. Rather than trusting that God is going to take care of this on His own, I'll solve the problem. But what's fascinating is what comes next, and we won't read this, we're going to jump in a little bit lower. But what comes next is as Saul leaves the cave, he goes out and he's out with his men, and David leaves the cave with this edge of his, uh, the robe, and he yells out to Saul, and he is trying to convince Saul, Saul, 
All these people telling you I want to kill you are lying to you. I could have just taken you out and I didn't. And he really humbles himself before Saul. This is fascinating because here David made a mistake based upon his conviction that are given to him by God, and he goes out and publicly acknowledges this mistake. And it's fascinating what happens when Saul responds. As we pick up in verse 16, the second half of verse 16, this is after David comes out and really uh, throws himself humbly at Saul and identifying, I'm not here, I'm not going to harm you. Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day that you have dealt well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul, and then Saul went home, but David and his men stayed up and went up to the stronghold. This is interesting. So David throws himself out humbly, and what do we see happen? We see a, a 180 with Saul. Now, Saul, this is fascinating what's going to go on with Saul over the course of the next few chapters in the book. But, but what's interesting is when David does this, I, I, I would offer there's, these are three miraculous results by David doing this and honoring God. The first one is Saul feels guilty. David makes Saul, Saul remember Saul, the guy throwing spears at David, throwing spears at his son? He's angry. But now he feels guilty because of David's humility. Have you ever been in a circumstance where somebody feels really down or something? Oftentimes we make other people feel what we feel. And in this circumstance, by David being humble, what he does is he takes that guilt that was on him and now he's putting it on to Saul, where it really should belong. Saul shouldn't be doing what he's doing. And Saul's going to acknowledge that because Saul acknowledges David's right to the throne. All this time, Saul has been going after David because he knows David's going to be king. But here we publicly see Saul acknowledge, David, you're going to be king. That brings up an odd dynamic with what Saul's doing. Because he's going to continue to pursue David later on. But he's acknowledging you're going to be king. So what that has to look for is that we have to look at Saul readily acknowledges, I'm now acting out against God. When we're humble and we honor God in our lives, and regardless of the situation, what it does is it forces others to recognize and acknowledge that God not only exists, but that God is in control. And when people are in, con- in conflict with, with God in and, and cer- certain circumstances, it forces them into a recognition of, I'm not in conflict with you, I'm in conflict with God. And that's what happens here with Saul. It's the recognition of, David, I, I want to kill you, but I recognize that really my conflict is with God because God has anointed you and you are going to be king. That's fascinating to me. Because this dynamic of what's going on here is so, uh, so important for us to really recognize that in our own lives, some of what we have to do is just walk with Christ. That's all it takes. There's books upon books upon books upon books of how to lead somebody to Christ, what to do, and all this stuff. But a lot of times, all we have to do is walk it. Honor God in our lives. I can't think of a, a time in the history of our nation where it's more important for Christians to actually walk with Christ, to let that be on display. And the final acknowledgement by by Saul, or the final miracle is is Saul recognizes, I'm going to end up dead. And the the end result in this, because if you're going to be king, something has to happen to me. Take care of my family. Let them continue to live. These are important because as as you get on in the story, a little bit later on into 2 Samuel and all that, this becomes important stuff. But for us, there's this dynamic where there is kind of a cultural problem with this. Remember, it's it's, David could have solved the matter on his own, but he, he didn't. He allowed for Saul to leave. And in our culture, there's this notion of this thought process of if it's to be, it's up to me. Or elsewhere, we see uh, things, uh, statements that people make, God helps those who help themselves. You know, that's not in the Bible, by the way. 
But we have this dynamic culturally that, that I need to do these. I need to take the action. I need to do whatever it is. And it's really up to me to solve this problem because God really just needs my help right now. And I've done this, and I think almost everybody in the room, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but the wives, you can tell me just by nodding, yes, he's done it. Because we do this, don't we? We tend to really kind of look at this and think, oh, here's the circumstances. God really just wants me to help him out. God doesn't need your help. He's God. But we find this is, is a cultural problem for us that we really start to lose track of who God truly is. The prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. What's being stated here is really recognize the truthfulness of it. If you're going to boast anything, you're going to do anything, really just recognizing who God is and trusting in Him. And that's what we see David do. And I find it an important aspect because in my life, oftentimes there are circumstances that I'll forget part of it. Is, Look at this. God, you really want me, to, you want me to fix this, don't you? This happens in my home all the time. If you've got kids, you know how difficult it is to trust God. Because, boy, look at what this little turd is doing. I'm sure God wants me just to tear him up right now. Amen. That's, yes. <laughs> and then ultimately, but it's really, oh, God, I just, I, I'll trust him to you. And you can tell which one of my kids now is having problems. It's one of the four boys. I'll trust them to you. But ultimately, that's what we're left with is, is really, can I solve the problem? Now, that doesn't mean God's calling me to sit on my hands. But it doesn't mean that the circumstances drive my decisions. My knowledge and understanding of who God is in my life, and allow, it allows me to put trust in Him. And all this is fascinating because as we turn the page into chapter 25, David's going to forget this. And, and that's just interesting because as we go into chapter 25, what we're going to see is David's internal struggle is going, to, it's going to shift a little bit. There's a gentleman named Nabal. And I'll set the story up here and then we'll jump into a little bit later into verse 25. Nabal, his name literally means fool. And he's a rich guy. And he's about to have all this, he's going to have his sheep sheared and they're going to have a big feast and a big festival and party and stuff. And David's been watching his shepherds out in the field and protecting him and protecting his property. Nabal didn't ask for this, but David's doing it out of the kindness of his heart. So David sends men to Nabal. He says, hey, we've been protecting you. And David's looking out trying to help his men out. I want you to bring, give us some food because we've been watching this, and nothing of yours has been destroyed because we've been protecting you. And here's Nabal's response. Nabal answered David's men, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? This is in verse 10 of chapter 25. There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and water and meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men who come from I don't know where? So David's young men turned away and came to, came to his men. Uh, every man, and, uh, I'm sorry, came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword. About 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. And I'm going to jump over to verse 21. As David's going to say here, David, uh, David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. He has returned to me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belongs to him. There's an interesting statement there, because that's the same statement that Saul had just made to David. I repaid you evil for good, and, and yet you continue to be good. This is, I'm going to offer to you the same circumstance. Different characters, but the same circumstance. David has been good, and in response to that, he's been receiving evil. But David has a drastically different approach in this, set, in this setting. Let's kill him. And he's going after it. David is furious. But it's the same situation. Why is there such a difference in his reaction? The first time we've got David going after Saul and, and has this opportunity, but David humbles himself and, no, I'm going to repay Saul good for the evil he's giving me. But here, this guy's giving me evil. I'm going to kill him. 
Why is this? And I, I would offer there's, there's a couple different circumstances that perhaps could go into this. Nabal is an idiot. And he's forgotten his status. He's forgotten who David is. Nabal has a different status than that of king. Maybe that goes into the decision making here. I think here is David saying, God, it really needs my help here because I need to feed these guys, these guys that are following after me. We've been protecting them, and I've got to show some, some puff up a little bit, and God really wants me to do this. And then the third thing is, I think what really drives this for most of us, I deserve better. I deserve better than what this idiot's given me. I deserve better than how this person's treating me. How often that's the case when many of us think about circumstances in life. Don't I deserve better? And, and that's where I think what happens here with David, because he's, this is going to drive his reaction. He's not, he, there's no really thinking about this. This is, let's strap on your swords, we're going to town. And that makes sense to us a lot of times, because this is really the guttural response. And I don't know if women have this response as much as men, but when somebody wrongs you, it's really a call to puff up your chest. And really, okay, you want to wrong me? Somebody cuts you off in traffic, what do you do? That's right, you zip around in front of them and cut them off. That's what you're supposed to do, right? No! That's the wrong reaction, by the way. Everybody's going to come back with dinged up cars next week. <laughs> Pastor, that's what you said to do. No. That's the wrong. But that's what happens. We have this guttural response where we're going to react to it. And that's what happens to David here. And in the midst of that, what I think happens for David is he forgets to, to really recollect, recollect what God has done in his life and who God has called him to be. You see, if he would rightly remember, he would have the same expectation of Nabal that, that he's had of, of Saul and the same expectation of himself. Identifying I'm called to be king. I'm called to this position that God has set me apart for. And if I go after him and react like that, that's going to tarnish my reputation. How important is that for a Christian to always remember God's called you out of the world to be set apart? Oftentimes we forget that. We were called to be set apart. We're called to be a living stones. We're a priesthood of believers. Set apart specifically because God has called you to something greater. And yet oftentimes we will find ourselves reacting. A second thing that it's important for us to remember is God is still sovereign. God is sovereign regardless of the circumstances, regarding, regardless of what's going on. God is still in control of all things. I think David might forget that here in this moment of time. And then finally, a statement that I hate, that my wife always reminds me of. I love the statement, I deserve better than this. But my wife is very good at reminding me, no, Steve, you deserve death. And half the time, I think she's the one that's willing to deliver it. <laughs> but really, we look at this in terms of, if you look, think back to the time, the moment of your acceptance of Christ as your Savior, that's the point at which most of us have great clarity of who we are before God. And really recognizing, I owe Him a debt that I can't repay. And yet it is, it is His grace that has paid this debt for me. And that's a beautiful thing because if we can remember that and that dictates and put that out in the, in the forefront of our minds as we walk through the world, that allows us to have greater grace for others. Even when their name is Nabal, which is fool. Even when they're screwing up and, and doing things that are, that you're like, what are you kidding? They're repaying you evil for the good that you've put out. But right now, David's going to go kill him. David's on the way. But in the backstory that we're not going to cover, we'll jump in a, a little bit here. Nabal's got a wife, her name is Abigail. You might remember Abigail's name if you've read through your Bible because she's going to become David's wife. So something has to happen here. Nabal has a wife named Abigail. Nabal's servants go to Abigail and say, hey, your idiot husband's going to get us all killed. And she said, you're right, he's an idiot. So she gathers together a bunch of food and stuff that she's going to take. And she says, we're going to go make an offering. We're going to give this to David. And we're going to set this thing right. And this is fascinating because I look at this in times, and, and, and most of us, I, <laughs> this is a perfect time for me to say this because I've been gone for six weeks. Even my wife has had to hold things together. Sometimes it just takes a wife to get something right. And, and that's important for you guys to remember. I've got this down. 
But sometimes they tell you that's what's going to happen because she's going to come back on scene and she's going to set this thing right. And when we jump in here in verse uh, 21, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, down in 23. We're going to read a little bit of a longer section here in chapter 25. So she's going out and she's got this stuff. She's going to give an offering to David because that's what he's asked for. But she's also, her goal is we got to stop him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my lords, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and, tell the, uh, and hear the words of your servant. Let not my lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, I think my wife has said that. <laughs> How many wives right now have just thought, yeah, this is true. That's, don't be afraid. Go ahead. We know it's true. Most of us men know it. I'm looking for Rebecca's hand, and it's not up, but I know it's true. <laughs> so this is the, this poor guy. This is his wife talking him up. <laughs> but I, I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord, whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this, let this present, present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men to follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you so long as you live." And she's going to go on there and, and continue to praise David. But what's, what's fascinating here is what she's doing is she's going to humble herself to go before David. And it doesn't seem like it in the midst of this, but she's going to honor both David and her husband in this. Her husband screwed up, and she's going to set things right. And she's going to dissuade David by identifying, don't, because, don't put this blood guilt on your hands. Remember who you are. So her entire purpose and goal here is really to clarify to David, this thing you're going to do is, is evil. Don't do it. And it's, it's fascinating because I, I think in this moment, David has embraced this notion of, I'm going to go kill. But she reminds him, remember who you are. And it's fascinating because then David has this opportunity to ignore her. One of the things in counseling, I've done it for years, and, and one of the things that, that I, would be so frustrating if you've ever done any counseling is that you, week after week, somebody tells you the same problem. And you've given them input, and you've counseled them, and you've offered them input, and they come back the next week, well, did you do it? No. Well, why not? Well, because of this, and they always, there's always an excuse that goes with it. And people don't tend to heed good counsel. And so David's in this position where here's the, here she comes, she's going to offer this to you and really to attempt to dissuade him from this by really identifying, remember who you are, don't put this blood guilt on your hand, and David has the option to ignore her. But let's see what David does. In verse 32, David says, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from avenging myself with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been, uh, there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. David was going to kill all the men. Um, so here David heeds this counsel. He's going to, and, and as a byproduct of that, what we see happen is David's going to retain his reputation. David's also going to turn back and trust God. The same thing he did with Saul, he's now going to do with Nabal. He's going to trust God to deal with this. And because of that, David's not going to miss the miracle. And there is a miraculous aspect to this because ultimately, I don't think I have another slide. Oh, I do. Uh, ultimately, there is a miracle that is going to transpire in the midst of this. And this is important for us to recognize because oftentimes when we solve the problem on our own and we don't wait for God, we miss the miracle. What's going to happen in a moment is, is she's going to go back and Nabal's going to be having a party and he's going to be drunk and she's not going to say anything to him at night. He's going to get up the next morning and she's going to say, here's what happened. And he was coming to kill you. And Nabal's going to fall into a coma and die 10 days later. God kills him. Which is fascinating to me. I think that's a beautiful thing. God takes this dude out. 
Because ultimately, David trusted in God. And he left God time to do the work. And many times in our lives, there are circumstances where we fail to trust in God or we seek to really fill the gap that we think God has forgotten about. I see this in relationships with young men and young women, mostly young women, but with young men and women. I just love him so much. This is the one that God's called for me. It's really this guy. And some of you who have older kids will recognize this and say, are you serious? This guy's a joker. Well, he's just all this. And then later on, his problems that manifest. You say, I told you this was coming. But we want to see what we want to see. I'm so glad my wife didn't see who I really was. But she trusted God would deal with it. But really, we look at this in terms of circumstances when we miss the miracle that happens when we wait. I've seen numerous people rush into a relationship or rush into a, a, a job or something else and, and just to solve whatever the problem is at that moment when God had something bigger for them. They want to force an issue. Sometimes the best thing you can do is wait and trust that God is going to see this through and that God is going to meet this need. And when David does that, what we're going to see is consistently throughout his life, God is going to meet the need. It just requires him to apply the brakes a little bit and slow down. And that's important for us as we consider in our own lives. Perhaps you've got a circumstance going on. Maybe there's a situation where you've got to make a decision. Maybe it's time to apply the brakes and say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to trust you with whatever it is that's going on and and whatever it is that you've called me to do. I'm going to trust you with that. Sometimes that is walking through a door that God has opened and saying, God, I'm going to trust you because this decision doesn't make sense. But I know it's you that's called me to do this. I can offer to you that's a scary thing. But when you do that, you allow time for God to work the miracle and then you don't miss it. And that's fun. Because then you get to your relationship and your love for God grows by leaps and bounds because you look at this and say, it didn't make sense, and yet God met the need. And this is why these people that get up and give their testimonies, oftentimes we look at that and we're scratching our head, that's amazing. Because it's filled with those moments. And so as we consider this portion of time in David and his life, I, it really, this is, this is old stuff. This is from thousands of years ago in David's life, and, and it kind of puts me in a position, says, well, what's the point? What do we do now? What are we going to do with all this information? You know, what, what do you do with that? How do you apply that into your life? I think the first thing you ought to ask is, how do you respond when you make a mistake? You see, David screwed up on the front end. We go back to him with Saul. And what he didn't do was, was he was going to react to a situation, and he, and he started to, but then he recognized, I messed this up. And what he did was then he made it right. He proclaimed, now, now if you screwed up, that doesn't mean you have to stand up in front of everybody and say, I screwed this up. But he goes back and makes it right with the individual he screwed, screwed it up with. Makes it right with God, and then he makes it right with Saul. And what that does is it changes the story and changes the tenor of what's going on. And it it establishes that David trusts God and it builds his character while he's lost or he's out in the wilderness hiding and and hiding for his life. It builds his character in that moment of time. That he's a man that trusts God. And as the nation's going to need a king in a few chapters, and he's the one, they're going to trust him. But what do you do when you make a mistake? How do you respond to that? Oftentimes, many of us would like to hide it. We shove it under the rug and say, oh, it's not really there. And we'll go on in our lives and live this life without ever fully acknowledging that. And I would offer to you, if that's you, if you've screwed it, you don't have to publicly proclaim your mistakes, but at least own it. Man, I jacked this up. I messed up X, Y, or Z. Own it before God and see what He does with it. Because he can take that and he can turn that into a miracle and then you won't miss it, similar to David with Saul. Second thing is, what do you do? How do you respond when you've been wronged? Do you react or do you remember who God is? 
It's a tendency for us, and I think a desire oftentimes for us to really react when we've been wronged. This is something that, that many of us struggle with or, or even, even just have to fully acknowledge, yeah, this is, this is me. I react. When something doesn't go the way I want it to go. I have this guttural reaction. Maybe it's you, you weep, maybe whatever it is. But, but how do you react when something doesn't go your way? Do you, do, you, do you react to it or do you remember who God is? Do you trust other people to God? People that have done you wrong, can you trust that God's going to deal with it? Because God sees the whole picture. When people have returned to what you've done good, when they return evil upon you, do you look at that and say, you know what, God, I'm going to leave them to you? Can you do that? Secondly, do you listen to wise counsel when it's offered? Oftentimes, this is a hard thing for us to do, to really look at that in, in terms of, okay, they're giving me counsel. Because what happens when it's wise counsel? It's usually what you don't want to hear. That's why I tell people in marital issues, don't talk to your friends because they're going to give you counsel that you want to hear. Go talk to somebody who really doesn't like you very much because they're probably going to tell you the truth. No, get wise counsel. Get the counsel that's really going to look at this and say, honor God with your life. But are you willing to hear it? Because all the counsel in the world is meaningless if you don't apply it and, and take it and hear it and apply it into your life. And that's what David does immediately, and that's what's fascinating. It's an important thing for us to learn in this. And then finally, trusting God. In our lives, do we, do we leave time for Him to work it out? It's a fast-paced culture. It's an independent culture. If you've got kids, you know that the world is telling them to be independent. If you grew up in America, you know the world is saying, be independent, be independent-minded. If it's to be, it's up to me. If, and, and all of this stuff, all these different things that we tell ourselves. But can you trust God? Can you trust God with the end result of your life? Can you trust God with every day when you wake up in the morning that He's the one that sustains your breath, that sustains your heartbeat? Do you realize that the truthfulness of the sovereignty of God is the fact that you can draw breath is because of His grace and love? Can you trust God with your children? Can you trust God with your grandchildren? Can you trust God with everything that you have? Because that's the call for a Christian. It's not to trust Him with a little bit and I'll solve the problem. It's to trust Him with everything. Because it may be that He calls you to a point in your life where He says, I want you to give up everything and do this. And if you're not trusting Him in the smaller things, when it comes to that point in time, that's going to be difficult. And we live in a time where really it's, it's a chaotic time. We're no longer the, the voice of morality in our nation. There's deaf ears that don't want to hear. There's, there's shots being taken of, of really making it disreputable to be Christian. There's, there's all of this stuff going on. What better time in your life to begin trusting God than right now? Because if it gets worse, what are you going to do? Solve the problem on your own? I'll offer to you, saints, if, if you, you think that you can solve America's issues, you better start trusting God. Because I don't think we can fix it. I think it has to be a, 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 another great awakening of the need for God. And that can only be done through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. But if you don't trust that God's going to move you, that God's going to place you where He needs you, that God is going to meet the needs that you have, that God is going to deal with the issues in your life, then that's going to make it difficult at best to continue to walk in a manner that's faithful and worthy to the calling to which you've been called. So with, with that, it, it's interesting. In the midst of this, we're a part of a church. And, and I, the poor elders, whenever God takes me away for a period of time, my mind goes a thousand miles an hour. And usually from week to week, I've got a schedule. So I go, I mean, it's Sunday, so after this I'll go home, I'll kind of relax a little bit, and then I'll begin, start thinking, so Sunday, next week's service starts today for me. And so you start planning that, and you go through, and then Monday, Tuesday, you have kind of this, when I get 
pulled away and I don't have the sermon and, and the, some of the circumstances to work on, God runs my mind a thousand miles an hour to really look at, are we doing this? Are we in an environment where this is being pro pronounced? I don't think we're doing a poor job, but I don't think we're doing as good a job as we need to do. So these poor elders got email after email. Poor Cyril's got a book that I wrote while I was gone of ways that we're going to build this to where we're in an environment where not only do you trust God, but you grow with God intimately, but you grow with others. So we've done life groups for quite a while, but the, imp the importance of it is going to be that that's going to be the medium from which we really develop and build this so that you're not left alone. So that it's not Sunday morning, you come in and you celebrate with everybody else and you don't see us for another week. Really, it's because, so that we become a family. So that those who are new get plugged in and built up in intimacy with God and others. So that those who are lost and seeking relationship with God can come here and find it. Because everything I asked you to do on this last slide, what now, is impossible without an environment realistically focused upon growing God. If you want to know how the church grew in the first century, it's because of that. The deck was stacked against them. They were bitten killed. Paul gets his head cut off in the midst of saying, you've got to be content. Well, he's about to go in and lose his head. How in the world does that happen? And we live in a world where ultimately there are those around the world giving their lives. This is probably the deadliest time and one of the deadliest times in the history of the world for Christians. And we don't see that much in the West. But when you start looking around the, the rest of the world where brothers and sisters are, they're getting killed. I heard a missionary, it was interesting, you get a group of, of chaplains, and everybody there uh, that I was at school with was Protestant which is unusual. Usually you get some Catholics and others and Jews and, and other folks, and it's kind of this thing. But we were all Protestant, and there was uh, some missionaries that were there, and, and it was fascinating because they were sharing some stories as we got to, to grow together. And, and one of the stories was there were missionaries in, in China, and the missionaries there were praying that the church in the West would get back to God. You know how convicting that is? I'm a pastor in the West. They're getting killed for their faith. And they're praying for us. That's an amazing thing to think about. To start looking at, can we sustain that? I don't think we can. We got to do it different. We got to do it better. And we got to do it to where we're a family. Because when persecution hits, the church either grows stronger or it falls apart. And what we see around the world is these strongholds of Christianity. The underground church all across the world is a beautiful thing. Well, we have a church on every street corner in America. And so the commitment I asked for the elders is really for this summer, this is the problem we're going to tackle. And I want to inform you of that because ultimately uh, we've kind of set out a pace for what we're going to do um, it's, it's not just the elders, there's some others involved. But really, this is the thing to tackle. How do we make it so that ultimately, when, you've got, when something's going on, you're not left out in the, alone, flailing in the wind? You've got a, a surrounding of brothers and sisters that love you and care for you. So that whatever the struggle is that you've got going on in your life, you can be honest about it. Because the dilemma for me is how do you continue to pastor in the West when the people who are being killed are praying for you because you've gotten it wrong? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, ah, Lord, what a gift it is you've given us, this freedom that we enjoy. But Father, there is a price with that dilemma to us. A dilemma of distraction versus submission. A dilemma that we can solve the problems on our own and we don't need you. The Lord, truly, we recognize and know that every breath that we breathe is contingent upon your grace. 
I pray for this church and I pray for the leadership and every, everybody who calls Crossroads home, whether they're here or not. Lord, I lift them up. And I pray that you would be in this place and you would draw us closer to you, that we would be a church that would rightly reflect who you are, that we would be a rock in the midst of these tumultuous times, that we would be a family that shines a light, that the world can see us and, and look and say, what is different about them? And what they will see is you, Lord. I pray that in our lives as individuals, but I also pray that, Lord, for us as a body of believers. That when Christ comes back, we would be presented as a pure virgin for him. As Paul states that to the church in Corinth, this destructed, nasty church, that that's his desire. Father, I pray that for us that we would seek to glorify you in all things, that we would seek to trust you in our lives. And Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.